Matthew chapter 5, we're in verse 6. We're on the fourth beatitude today. Knowing that these built off of each other, we started with broken in spirit, that we are spiritually bankrupt before God. There's nothing that we have that we can offer to him that's going to impress him except our broken spirit. And we come to him broken. And that causes us to mourn. We understand the depravity that we find ourselves in just by human nature, that we are far from him, that we live below his standard, that our human tendency is to resist the good that he asks us to do, to follow his way, to adhere to his will. We, we resist it. It should cause us to mourn when we accept that reality. And then last week we talked about the meekness that that, that position puts us in. We have no right to be proud, to, to uh, exert any power over other people, but really the, to, to follow the example of Jesus and to give to the benefit of others, to restrain any strength, power, influence that we have for the benefit of another person and to be meek. And here we find ourselves in this fourth beatitude that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We find ourselves in this place where we are unrighteous, that, that we're not righteous, we are unrighteous. And here, Jesus, in this beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, tells us here's kind of the mission of your life. Here's what's gonna drive and motivate your life if you're gonna follow me. It's gonna be this never-ending appetite, this desire, this craving for righteousness. And one of the first things I noticed when I started to prepare for this uh, message today was that the blessing is in the desire, not the outcome. The beatitude doesn't say blessed are the righteous, they shall be satisfied. It says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We know that righteousness is not something we're gonna obtain on this side of eternity. And the righteousness that we do have, that God sees on us and in us, is only because of Jesus, not because of anything that you and I could do to be righteous, other than put our faith in his son. So the blessing is in the desire to be righteous, the pursuit of it, the craving of it, not in the result of it. The blessing isn't in people, and, 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 and hopefully there's no, no one like this today in this room and listening to this message that, that say that I've made it, I've become, I've achieved it, I'm there. Because we can't do that on this side of eternity. It's impossible. But that we understand that we're, we're all on this journey together. And the blessing is in the pursuit it's in the desire, it's in the craving. So what is righteousness? Let's try to define it because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And we're gonna look at some other texts here in the Sermon on the Mount to help define the application of it. But, but I would define righteousness as, 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 as the things that are good and right and acceptable to God. The things that God sees as good and right, that he accepts. And the reason he can accept us as broken sinful human beings is because of the righteousness that Jesus gives us. I'll read you from 1 Corinthians chapter one, verses 26 through 31, and listen to what Paul writes. He says, remember dear brothers and sisters that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing to what the world considered important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Right? We have no right to, to brag, to be prideful. And then in verse 30, he says this, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. That's where our justification comes from. That's where our righteousness comes from because of what Jesus has done. And then he continues the thought. He says, he has made us pure and holy and he has freed us from sin. This is the work that Jesus has done for us. Not only does he justify us, but then he starts the process of sanctifying us. And he says, therefore, as the scriptures say, if you wanna boast, boast only about the Lord. 
Because if God sees anything that's good in you or me, it's because of Jesus. We have no reason to boast. There's no goodness that we can offer. There's nothing we could show to impress God apart from the work that Jesus is doing in our lives. And because of that, he sees us as righteous. Because of what Jesus has done, he sees us as righteous. So if it's good and acceptable and right in his eyes, what does that look like? Because it's easy to talk about here in this setting. It's, 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 it's a great theory, right, to, to kind of conceptualize. But what does it look like tomorrow morning at 930 when, when, when at work things are crashing around us? When the day we planned is falling apart, when the phone rings or we get the text message that we hoped we weren't getting or we get caught by surprise with, with some bad news, what, what then? What do we do? What does it look like? The word righteous in the gospels only appears a few times. Only one time does it appear in the other three gospels combined. In the gospel of Matthew, it appears seven times, five times in the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus uses this word five times. So let's look at the context. Just a couple verses ahead in verse 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we see the kind of the context of what righteousness looks like for us. If we, if we hunger and thirst for it, we will be satisfied. That's great, right? We wanna be satisfied. Nobody wants to walk around living their life feeling like they're lacking with, you know, equating like what it feels like to be hungry and thirsty, wanting, needing, desperate. We wanna be satisfied. We wanna feel whole. And Jesus can give us that. That's the good news couple verses down and he says, listen, if you're striving for righteousness, you will be persecuted for it. It's counter to the culture. It's against the values of the world. And they're not just going to sit idly by. They're going to persecute. They're going to attack because they don't like it. Because if God says it's good, right, and acceptable, the world says, no, it's not. And they're going to disagree, which tells us this, that righteousness in our lives is not going to be popular. It's just not. So get ready for that. I had a friend tell me years ago, and I've repeated it multiple times, that we perform for an audience of one. The life we live is for him. That's the only opinion that matters. We don't don't live this life for each other, to, to, to get applause from each other. And we definitely don't live this life to get applause from the world. They're not gonna give it to us but it's our heavenly father that we live for. So this righteousness that we should hunger and thirst for, the one that we will find satisfaction in is not popular. It just won't be. Then in verse 20, just a few more verses down, he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember that the Pharisees were the religious elite, right? They they prided themselves on being able to keep the rules better than everybody else. They made the rules harder. And that's where they got their pride. It was a show for them. They wanted to show you how much better they were at keeping the rules than everybody else was. And here Jesus says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So how does that work? Because the Pharisees were the religious elite. Well, They were legalists. It was all about the rules for them. Their scorecard was on how good did I do today keeping the rules versus how good did you do keeping the rules. But had nothing to do with it being about a relationship or a response. It was all about the rules. And God's not impressed with us keeping rules. God's impressed when we live a life in response to what he's done for us. So not only is is living a life that we strive for, crave, desire, hunger and thirst for righteousness, one that's not popular, but it's also one that works its way from the inside out, where the Pharisees, it was all about what's on the outside. God says, my righteousness will start on the inside. This sanctification process, this changing, this making you holy starts on the inside. Your behavior will be evidence of what I'm doing inside. This transformation begins with your heart and mind, then the behaviors. So it's about being focused internally more than externally. 
Then in 6.1, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. This idea that we're performing for each other. He says, for then you will have no reward from your father in heaven, which tells us that this pursuit of righteousness, this hunger and thirst, this appetite, this craving is personal between us and God. Collectively, we are the body of Christ and we pursue his righteousness together. But ultimately, it comes down to what you and I do individually with him. So it's personal. And then 633, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Just a couple of verses leading up to that, he's talking about why we worry about what we're gonna eat and drink and wear and the confidence that we can have that God is our provider and our protector and he's gonna sustain us and, and, and he's in control. And he says, here's your responsibility. Just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Just seek the things of God and you'll be okay. Everything will work itself out. God is in, con- in control. And the things you worry about today, God is gonna provide anyways. So just keep your priorities straight. Don't let this world distract you. Don't let the things happening around you get you to take your eyes off the one that matters. Make his righteousness your first priority and everything else will fall into place. So we see righteousness as as good, acceptable, and right in God's eyes. And it plays itself out by, by... because it's not gonna be popular. So get ready for the the attacks. The people that are close to you are not gonna come pat you on the back because you're living your life to God's standard. They're gonna ridicule, they're gonna tease, they're gonna make fun of, they're gonna attack. But it's personal between us and God. It's the only relationship that matters. It's got eternal significance. And our outward behavior should be a reflection of what God's doing inside. If all we're focused on is creating a show that I'm gonna play the part around these people, but when I'm around these people, I can be a different person. We shouldn't have a a personal and a private and a public persona. We are who we are, right? God, if we're submitting to him, we are a work in progress. He's sanctifying us, he's changing us, he's renewing our mind, he's transforming us, he's creating anew. And we just need to be prioritized our life on his righteousness. Here's what God wants from us. God ultimately wants us to want what he wants. He wants us to desire the things that he loves. Here's where this pushes against our flesh. There was a time in my life where I walked away from my faith. I was not living according to God's standards. And people would give me these scriptures. And they would try to encourage me. And and it didn't encourage me. It it irritated me. Because I already knew the verses. But I didn't want what God wanted. So don't tell me that I need to want what God wants. I didn't want it. But what God does is he changes our hearts. He changes us to want what he wants. And I think this is a lot of the resistance that the world has to being a follower of Jesus, to being a Christian, or however we want to describe putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Is that they don't want what he wants and they think they're going to lose in the agreement. That they're going to be on the, uh, on the losing end of, of giving their life to him, that they're going to suffer, that God's going to short them but the text says they will be satisfied. Not shorted, not left wanting or needing. No, that appetite that we have, like a physical appetite, what what cures our hunger pains? Food, we need to eat. When we're thirsty, we need to drink. What happens when we don't? That desire intensifies. It It gets bigger in our lives. And there's probably you know, probably nobody in this room has ever been close to physical starvation. But my guess is if we saw somebody who was starving and we went up to him and said, listen, I can offer you, I can offer you a, a, a meal or a million dollars. Which, which do you want? They're going to take the meal. And our hearts, as spiritual beings that we are, 
are so spiritually starving and the world is saying, listen, I can give you a million dollars. I can give you all kinds of stuff, but what we need is satisfied. And it's only gonna come through Jesus in the pursuit of his righteousness, of living according to his will and his way. And we find that we don't get shorted. We get more than we deserve. We, we get way more than we deserve. But the blessing is in the pursuit. It's in wanting it. The blessing comes from wanting what God wants. If you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, we should be able to look back on our life and, and say, these things didn't matter to me a couple years ago, but now they do. And I was pretty insensitive to this group or to this cause or to this thing, and, and, and now I'm not because God is changing my heart. He's changing the way I see things. I'm starting to want the things he wants. And the things of this world grow strangely dim. The things that we think are important now, we realize really aren't when they're of this world. And really all that we need is Jesus. Everything else can go away because he's all we really need. But I think the world says, you know what? I'm not gonna trade. See, we have this, this appetite in our human nature that says, uh, you know, if you wanna be satisfied, you just need somebody to love you, to accept you, to be there for you, you just need love. Or you just need money. Like if you could just have somebody gift you enough money to pay off all these bills, you would be satisfied. You'd be satisfied. If you could just get that job, if you could just get that promotion, if you could just get that degree that's gonna put your life into this place, that's all you need. You would be satisfied if you could do that. You just need these things. You just need this stuff. You just need that house. You need that type of car. You just need a bank account at this level. You need your 401k to be here. If you could get those things, you will be satisfied. That's what the world tells us. You will be satisfied. And they're selling us counterfeit gods. They're selling us things. If we're not sharp enough to know the difference, we are taking a fake. And we don't realize it's fake until we're dissatisfied. Until we realize it didn't work. It didn't fix it. The money didn't fix the problem. The person didn't fix the problem. The stuff didn't fix the problem. The problem is our, we're, we're starving spiritually and we're trying to feed ourselves with things that can't satisfy. We're spiritual beings. There's a, there's a God-sized hole in our heart that only he can fill. But the world says, no, no, no. You can fill it with other stuff. It'll work. Just keep piling more in. Pile it. Take more, do more, buy more, spend more, achieve more, get more. And we just find ourselves more dissatisfied. But the reality is God doesn't disappoint. He doesn't disappoint. If we do what he asks, he does what he promises. And the only satisfaction we're ever going to achieve in this life is when we pursue his righteousness when we start to see the things that are good and right, acceptable to him as our highest priority. That not only do I, do I want my life to be lived in a righteous way, but I wanna see your life lived that way as well. That the world needs more people pursuing, like we pursue three or four or five meals a day, some of us, right? Pursuing those things with that type of passion and intensity that the world can offer all kinds of things to pacify, but we know they're counterfeit. They're not gonna work. The only thing that's really gonna satisfy is his righteousness, the pursuit of it, that each day we get a little bit closer, knowing that on that side of eternity, we'll experience the completeness of our righteousness. But God says, you will be satisfied if you pursue my righteousness. Like you pursue meals and drinks, pursue what's good and right acceptable to me. And you will be satisfied. Satisfaction guaranteed. And if we desire anything other than that, we will spiritually starve. And I, and I know that there's people around us that are spiritually starving and they don't realize it. If you've been around a child, an infant for very long, you realize that they, they start to unravel 
and they don't know why. And they're throwing fits and they're crying and, and this pacifies them for five seconds and then they're done with They're hungry. They need to eat and they don't know it. And sometimes they don't even want to eat when they're that hungry. And we have to force them to sit in the high chair. You have to eat this. And then when they eat it, they calm down. Right? That, that craving's been satisfied. There's peace in their being again. And how many of us are spiritually irritated and agitated and unraveling and we don't know why? That there's just, it always seems to be chaos in our life. Something, nothing seems to fall into place. Nothing seems to work. I can't get any traction. Maybe we're, we're just ignoring the fact that we're spiritually starving. We're trying to satisfy that, that craving with other things that aren't gonna work. We're not gonna be satisfied. Only God can satisfy that deepest hunger and thirst. Jesus says this in John chapter six. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now here's Jesus talking. Is he, is he telling this audience, listen, if you just believe in me, if you trust in me, you'll never be hungry or thirsty again. Like you've, you've eaten your last meal for the rest of your life. You'll never have to eat again. No, he's talking about spiritually. That that craving in your soul can be satisfied. The interesting thing I think about Jesus is that when we come to him because we're spiritually starving and thirsty, not only does he quench that, but the more we get of Jesus, the more we want of Jesus, the more he gives us of Jesus. It's a never ending cycle. He does quench and creates more desire and he fulfills that. And we can stay spiritually satisfied in this life. We're longing for something to satisfy this appetite that we have. It reminds me of, of the story of, of the prodigal son, and, and I'll close. Prodigal son had all this stuff with his father, thought that what was out there was better than what he had here. So he asked his dad for his portion of the inheritance, and he went out and did what any of us would do with those types of resources and no pursuit of righteousness, right? He partied it away. And he found himself where this world leads us to, disappointment. And it wasn't until he was knee deep in the mud of a pigsty, eating the food of the pigs, that the text tells us he came to his senses. It was at the bottom. It was at his lowest point that he finally realized everything he needed, he already had. But he left his father's house. And when he came to his senses, he went back. He realized that it was in his father's house, it was in his father's care, it was in the right relationship with the father that he was satisfied. It wasn't out there doing all the things the world promised. It was that road that took him to the bottom of disappointment. We truly will never understand what it means to be satisfied until we see that the Father is the only one that can provide it. And it's near him, it's with him, it's by him that we are satisfied. So I don't know where you all are with God, where you stand in your relationship with him, but if we are far from the Father, we should just expect disappointment because that's what the world delivers. It overpromises and underdelivers. But if we could see that what God wants for us is good. He sent his son to restore this relationship. He sees us as righteous because of what Jesus has done for us. Our souls will be satisfied. We won't leave the father because we know it's there that not only do we feel satisfied, that that, that, that appetite, that desire that we have is filled, right? But but we feel valued and loved and important and we have purpose in this life. The things that we desire, God gives us through him. So I pray if we've wandered away that we come back 
If our life is in a trajectory where we're chasing the things of this world that won't deliver, that, that God is making us very aware of that right now and that we respond to it and that we put our faith in his son, that he quenches that thirst and hunger that our soul has and we're satisfied. Father, I thank you for Jesus and for his love. I thank you for sending him to die in our place that he bore your wrath not for what he's done, but because of what we've done, what we will do. God, I pray that if we are chasing the things of this world, like the prodigal son, may we become aware. May we come to our senses and see that our needs are only going to be met when we are with you. That the desires that we have, God, will only be satisfied when we give our life to you. That it's with you, God, that our needs are met. That this appetite that we have, this thirst is satisfied. And then we have this life that Jesus promised. He came to give us life, give us life in abundance, an abundance of him. And may you continue to satisfy us. Help us to be a light in this dark world. Help us to offer hope to a dying world around us. That Jesus just isn't a way, he is the way. Use us, God. We thank you for your love. It's in his name I pray, amen.